couple things here. Uh, I asked, um, Brian called me up and said, John, we're doing this session on cloud security. And I said, oh, I can talk about that. I said, I talk about that all day. I said, um, you know, how many hours are you gonna give me? He says, 20 minutes. I said, okay, well, what, what are we gonna do in 20 minutes um, that's gonna have impact? And uh, I do like the TED Talk format. It sort of forces me to sort of think I'm very much a communicator. You know, I'd learn by communicating. Um, so I tried to distill this down to sort of some top of mind things that um, I've been having customer conversations with customers and just uh, a little bit about what we're doing internally at Microsoft IT because we run a pretty um, uh, advanced program and I think a lot of people uh, want to understand kind of how we're doing it. Uh, and then a few things in terms of the innovation piece, sort of the, the sort of next frontier that is really the, the sort of hot topic. Um, before I start that, you know, these are what I often talk about in terms of these are the modern priorities. And a lot of, you know, for those of us who have been in security a long time, is a bit of a, uh, a shift and a change in thinking that's required to really embrace this sort of new world. And this, you know, it's not just cloud, but it's hybrid and it's devices and vast connectivity, massive amounts of data. Uh, and these are really the four that kind of, when we distill down what, what's really meaningful, is these four areas. Uh, first, certainly identity is, you know, we call it the new perimeter. It's that new security control plane. Um, you know, traditionally that's been the network. Uh, we can talk a bit more about that, but you know, it's really difficult in cloud. Everything's encrypted. I've got a variety of devices that are not all being piped through my, my network sensors and my network devices. And so, you know, I, I would never say to get rid of those things because there's still lots of, you know, you know, segmentation defense in depth, but it's not really the control plane. So identity is really where we've been investing and um, things like conditional access especially um, are uh, really transforming that. Pervasive data compliance, this is, um, you know, we've seen a lot of data breaches, huge data breaches lately, and, uh, you know, I think every uh, CISO or security organization I talked to is trying to get a handle on their data, you know, their data estate and their data governance. Because right now, this traditional, everybody's got access to everything, you know, whether it's external risks or insider risks is, you know, not the best strategy in 2019. So that's a huge uh, focus for folks. And then continuous monitoring. Um, you know, you can't protect what you can't see or can't monitor what's going on, either from those external threats or internal. That's a real challenge for people because trying to monitor everything in a really complex environment and then store all those logs is uh, very, very challenging. And then this notion that intelligence transforms automation and this intelligence at scale, and that's really twofold. One is, uh, you know, utilizing this vast, you know, array of threat intelligence. And if you're a small or medium organization, you probably don't have the ability to buy all these fancy threat feeds and curate things. And so you need to leverage, you know, the cloud to, to do a lot of that heavy lifting for you. And then the fact that, you know, cybersecurity skills are in short supply. And so you can't find the people to do all that. So that, you know, the, the automation has to come from, you know, that innovation that's, uh, you know, primarily being powered by the cloud. Okay. So I'm going to break this into three sections. The first is just around mi misconfiguration. You know, so many breaches due to misconfigurations lately, right? Capital One was in the news, obviously, uh, this summer. Huge, you know, just somebody put some stuff up there, didn't configure it properly. The IT organization, like Capital One runs a pretty strong security shop, and even they're not um, able to get it right 100% of the time. So, um, you know, I think, you know, Especially big complex organizations, it's hard to get a handle on, on assets when I have you know, a, a huge data state and maybe you have things in different subsidiaries, different supply chain issues. Uh, DevOps teams want to move quickly, right? Buy an, you know, buy an AWS, Azure subscription on my credit card, fire some stuff up there, shows the business, woohoo, high five in production, right? Oh, then they go away and forget about it. Uh, many different controls, security controls, and many places to configure those controls. And then a lack of just even knowledge that those controls exist. And how do I prioritize, if I do know what those are, how do I prioritize what's most effective in my environment? Uh, really challenging. Complexity of technical footprint, overconfidence in traditional network controls. We got it, we got a good firewall, we just upgraded the firewall. Good to go, right? Uh, and then, quite frankly, attackers are just automated scanning for bad configurations. You know, showed in, all sorts of things. I run my little, you know, home tenant for my family, and I go into Office 365, and I just look at the audit logs, and there are people brute forcing and password spraying my little environment uh, nonstop, constantly. 
you know, I, I was meeting with some, some folks here at RBC, uh, just phishing is just, it's off the charts and that's that automated scanning. So even if you miss that one configuration, even for 20 minutes, um, chances are someone's gonna get a foothold in there with that. And so what do we do? How do we do, you know, I think uh, Maxim did a great job of kind of setting things up. There's a lot of complexity here. There's a lot of moving parts. So how do we, what are we doing to make it easy um, or easier and to provide some of those guardrails for things? Uh, some of this stuff is relatively new within the last year, so I, I thought today would be a good day to, uh, to highlight that. Uh, but we're going to talk about Azure policy, being able to create those policies, apply them at different uh, management levels within your subscription or your tenant or your resource group or across multiple tenants, that you can enforce some organizational security policies, organizational guidelines, so that you can allow DevOps to go quickly, um, but also ensure that, that configurations that get deployed are deployed correctly and they're deployed securely, at least as much as we, we, can, we can do, at least to try to get the basic baselines right. There's a bunch of other pieces here you should check out in terms of blueprints, um, role-based access control policies. You can wrap up, package up like a web deployment uh, to have that deployed you know, the same way every time with the right configurations and the right security policies. So, um, Part of, you know, we just got our uh, Protected B uh, accreditation by the federal government for our Canadian data centers. We are um, going to release, uh, I don't have a timeline yet, but um, security policies in line with Treasury Board's control set for Protected B if there's any public sector folks for, for a broad reusability. So what are policies? A couple different things and then I'm, I'll show you what this looks like in the portal. So certainly enforcement and compliance, there's a pile of built-in policies there which I'll uh, demo, but you can create your own to meet your own requirements there. And uh, these can do this, you know, real-time, certainly evaluation enforcement. So um, you can bring policies, you know, new policies, so new resources or like VMs or other types of things will have to align with those policies or they won't be able to be deployed. But if you bring in an, uh, policies in an existing environment, it can give you compliance evaluation. And then you have a, a set of checklists and things you can do to go to remediate those. It also allows you to deploy them at scale. So you have multiple tenants, multiple subscriptions. You can have policies and have different hierarchies of management groups that you can apply those across all your different subscriptions. Maybe you have different you know, areas of business lines or departments or subsidiaries or whatever that structure is. And you can layer those things and manage it accordingly. And then, you know, there's some new things now uh, in there to be able to remediate and automate deviation from those policies. Um, so you have some visibility to go, what do I go fix? Stuff that, that is either was deployed before the policy was um, implemented or, you know, there's something wrong with my policy or I've got a, you know, an area that's brought on board uh, somehow. So let me try to, is this one working too? Let's just try to do this. So over here, I'll just go home for a second. So this is built in, you know, core Azure, sits right in the management plane below the Azure uh, Resource Manager. So it's got pervasive ability to touch uh, anything uh, that you would have here in Azure. And so you can see here, this is my mission critical Minecraft hosting uh, tenant here. So we'll use that as our uh, little demo. Uh, I'm just gonna go in here to policy, look at Azure policy. Uh, I don't have any assigned. We can go over here. There's a good section here called getting started. Everybody can see that. Actually, the screen's pretty good here. And so let's look at uh, you know, a whole host of definitions. So there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these built-in policies. So a good example of policy is, you know, I don't want my kids creating a Minecraft VM with you know, some 64-core machine because that's going to cost a lot of money. You know, similar types of things. So you set a policy say, these types of resources are only constrained to these types of VMs for these types of people and these types of management groups and these types of resource groups and so on. You can create all of those sort of complex layering structures in there. If I look over here, I'll just uh, look at categories, uh, or sorry, all types built in. You know, I can look at, uh, here I'll look at location. I know I'm on the clock here, so I'm gonna go quickly. So allowed locations. So for those of us in Canada, especially public sector, you have got some regulatory concerns, you wanna make sure anybody only deploys resources into the Canadian region, Canada East, Canada Central. Never gets deployed, you know, data at rest, not stored outside the country. Let's go and create one of those. So I've got 
a policy definition. The initiative definitions are really just a collection of policies. So I can say policy definition, uh, the definition location here. I don't have any management groups, but I'm going to create this on my Visual Studio Ultimate with MSDN subscription. And the name of this is Canada DCs only. Oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong one. I am wanting to do an assignment, not the definition. So here I'm going to assign a policy, and I'm going to call this... Policy definition. Okay, so here's all the built-in policies. I can look for a location. Allowed locations built in. And down here, look at parameters. Here's all the list of all the data center regions. I'm going to select Canada East and Canada Central. Creating policy assignment, allowed locations. I can name that whatever I want. And then for that, uh, the scope here is that Visual Studio Ultimate with MSDN subscription. Anything anybody creates within that subscription can only be deployed to the Canada data region, uh, data centers. If they try to do that to US East, US West, whatever, it's going to fail. And they'll get a you know, a, a information based on what you put in the description, say, that's not allowed, organizational policy. That can be applied. There's a pile of things there into... Um, uh, if I look at here, definition types, we'll look at initiatives. Right, this can even reach down into your VMs, uh, and there's a pile of stuff built in there for things like ISO 27001, PCI controls, NIST 853, all those standard things. So part of this, certainly to help people, you know, implement some policies, get the configurations right the first time, uh, and let's sort of stop the bleeding. Uh, with these misconfigured environments. The other uh, thing, that, so that's infrastructure platform as a service sort of in the Azure environment. If I hop over here to uh, Secure Score, so in the SaaS world, everyone familiar with Secure Score? I've seen that before. This is uh, something we've been investing in a ton in the last 18 months, and it's to help make it easy and to help identify the priority controls uh, and give you a score. And so the score isn't really, um, it's not necessarily like a credit score. Think of it as a risk reduction score. We're constantly adding controls in here to you know, increase the score. The idea is that you want to look at your trend over time, right? So here in my little demo tenant, I've done a few things and enabled MFA and whatnot. Um, and it shows you industry average, global average, right? Which is abysmally low, which is kind of scary. Um, and so on. And so if I look at improvement actions, it gives you a prioritized list of improvement actions. Right? Number four, block client forwarding rules on email. Why is that a good thing to do? What, what we've, exactly, what we've observed in all, you know, compromised email accounts across tens of thousands of customers in the cloud, probably the top three things that attackers will do first when they brute force or, or uh, um, guess a password. So it's in there, there's a rating against it, turn it on, you click this, it's gonna show you, you know, here's the description, here's why this is important, uh, and so on. You know, go here to um, where to set it up, okay? It's across now, Not just um, Office 365, but identity, data, devices, applications. Uh, and so Windows 10 is integrated in here and infrastructure. So super cool. Like just like do the top things. Like does everybody here use MFA on your personal and bank account? Right? I know it's a security community, so most people should be saying yes. The numbers? No, seriously, the, this is the number one recommendation. You know, like for, for, for breach, you know, protection or uh, compromise, enable MFA on identity. And the numbers globally, you know, I've seen the internal numbers, it is abysmally low. I don't know what's going on, but passwords are so broken. Uh, you know, brute force phishing, a uh, password spray 
are just um, highly automated. So please, you know, encourage your grandma, your kids, your work people, um, please turn that on. Okay. How am I doing, Brian? Two minutes. Oh, my God. I told you. Okay. A couple things here. Uh, there is a great, in terms of what Microsoft does, there's a great uh, link here, blog series, uh, IT Showcase. Um, so I'll, I'll make those slides available. You can go to that link. One of the things that... Um, one of the things that we try to do here at Microsoft uh, from a leadership set of principles is to really to create clarity. We work, live in a complex world and we, we deal with a lot of complex uh, things and there's a focus on you know, certainly encouraging leaders to synthesize information. This is how we describe our internal security program. This is how our CISO briefs it to the board of directors at Microsoft and it's really based on these six things. So the foundation of risk management and assurance uh, the ultimate goal here is information protection, and the three legs of the stool to ensure that happens is device health, identity, and data and telemetry, so that logging and visibility. And if we don't have one of those things not working properly, you know, the whole program falls down. Okay, and that's super fundamental to how we think about uh, keeping our, you know, employee, our, our corporate environment secure. And so a couple things here, device health, where we're at. Um, certainly, I mentioned edge protections in the past aren't that effective. You know, we don't allow unmanaged devices on our network. Last year we did. We saw an uptake of 300% attacks on mobile devices. And um, we've also made improvements in Intune, mobile device management, our platform. So we have a global policy now, no unmanaged device, or sorry, no unmanaged devices. You can bring your own device, but it's got to be enrolled in Intune. And I think... Lots of mobile device management matured enough that there can be good separation between the personal stuff and the work stuff. But unmanaged devices today present unprecedented risk because if that device is compromised, uh, you know, all the bets are off. They can, they can do whatever on that device. Uh, obviously, endpoint protection is a key part of that. We've made massive investments in Windows Defender, uh, advanced threat protection, you know, number on, on the top of the charts these days, Gartner Magic Quadrant Leader, uh, lots of big, big customers deploying that. And then conditional access is fundamental. Uh, it's not about just yes or no. It's about making a risk-based decision through identity, through uh, location of access, through health of that device, and a whole bunch of other parameters that we can bring, including all the threat intelligence that we collect. We apply that conditional access policy every single, um, you know, while the session is going on, not just one time. Uh, so I talked about that. I'm going to skip over that because Brian's standing beside me here. Uh, a couple things around just password. Uh, uh, we're on a, a huge journey to eliminate passwords, trying to really lead the industry on that. We know that they're broken. This isn't 1985. You know, I don't have my Commodore 64 anymore. Uh, we made big investments in Windows um, Hello. Uh, you know, modern devices, not just Surface. You know, ability to log in with that, that facial recognition, productivity plus security improvements there. Uh, the latest uh, build of Windows 10 supports the FIDO standard, so you can use your UB keys, you can use all sorts of other types of, of non-phone-based authentication. Microsoft Authenticator, you know, I've got it, I use it with Google, I use it with my password manager, with Amazon, with, you know, social media. Um, super easy to use. And we're kind of at this, you know, this is sort of what we would talk about in terms of a roadmap for passwordless for organization. It's really hard, right? Your printers have passwords, everything's got passwords. Uh, but you need to start somewhere. So we're sort of at that reduce uh, stage there, level two. But um, have a goal to get to the point where we remove passwords and password hashes from the identity system uh, completely. Okay, last but not least, uh, before I get off, and I'll be around for the rest of the evening, we can have a quick chat. Sort of, this is the future uh, in terms of, you know, where a huge chunk of innovation is coming from us. Most people are familiar here with the SIM, Security Incident and Event Management. Uh, lar sort of large, medium organizations probably have one, probably have big organizations, a big team of people that, that operate around that. And there's lots of challenges with that today. Logs, there's so many logs they're collecting. The infrastructure to support those and the storage um, is, uh, is certainly burdensome. 
uh, alert fatigue on the operators. They're not as agile as they really needed to be. Upfront costs, expensive to get set up. We need a lot of care and feeding with a lot of cybersecurity skilled experts which aren't available to be hired. And so um, the other factor is you know, cloud deployment and adoption is growing massively. And all the data is, you know, most of the data now is sitting in the cloud for a lot of these um, systems. And so customer or companies are looking at how do I pull all that out of the cloud, try to get it into my SIM, and it just gets unwieldy. So we've invested and built this cloud native SIM platform um, that really, you know, think about if you were to build a security operations center, didn't have to worry about network compute and storage, what would that be like? And then bring in, you know, a massive set of global threat intelligence automatically. So check that out. It's in preview. You can go into that Azure portal, just look for Sentinel, spin up a trial. Um, uh, lots of stuff on YouTube to take a look at that as well. Okay, do we have time for questions?